All right, Aditya, thanks for coming in today. Thanks for coming on the pod. Thanks for having me, Jeff. Uh, yeah, it's an honor. I think we talked about me being a fan uh, before coming on, and it feels like a, you know a real special place for like the New Zealand blockchain uh, community to come and be a part of. So yeah, I'm really happy to be here. I've got you as a writer or as an analyst, and you're associated with Brave New Coin. Perhaps you've been there a while, perhaps you haven't. Maybe you can tell us how you get involved with all of this uh, and what is Brave New Coin up to? Yeah, so I can start from the beginning. Uh, my initial introduction to crypto was with a flatmate at university, at university, sorry, who used to buy and sell things on Silk Road. And uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah he, he showed me what was going on with the Tor browser and you know, this crazy marketplace where it seems like you'd like buy all this nefarious stuff. And I was a bit like, wow, you know, what is happening in the world and what, what is up with this technology? Um, and I kind of forgot about it. Uh, and then when I was in university doing my master's degree um, in economics, I came across a couple of models um, for how like crypto could be used to evade capital controls. And I thought that was very interesting. Um, yeah, I left university. And, you know, we started doing some soul searching, I think economics research, uh, I wasn't cut out for it. And I sort of had like, <laughs> you know, grander visions for like making money and that sort of thing. Um, and I came across uh, this job application um, for a company called Brave New Coin, um, a crypto like research and data firm. And I thought it was very interesting. Uh, the task for the application was to write a story about the Lightning Network. And I think, yeah, from there, I kind of fell in love with it. I thought it was, you know, a really powerful concept, you know, the potential to change the world. And that was like, yeah, my eureka moment with crypto. Um, so you didn't know about the Lightning Network beforehand or? No, but I didn't know about it. I, yeah, I didn't really know how Bitcoin worked until yeah. I applied for that job. Um, I had a very cursory understanding, like most people do until they dive into Bitcoin about how it worked and what it was used for. Um, and yeah, you know, that was about six years ago. And I think this is not an uncommon experience for people in the space. Uh, crypto kind of pulls you in a bunch of different directions, you know, whether it's trading, whether it's looking into the tech, uh, whether it's, you know, narratives and like venture style investing. Um, so yeah, you know, I'm broadly a writer and an analyst at Brave New Coin, but I wear a few different hats in the crypto yeah. space. I'm a freelance writer as well. Um, I do analyst tasks for some of the funds that uh, Brave New Coin's parent company, Techemy, runs. Um, and I also is, assist with uh, some deal flow operations, which is essentially helping um, crypto startups raise funds. Um, just going back there a little bit, did you ever dig into the Silk Road yourself? No, more after the fact. Right. Um, yeah, like looking back on it, I think it is still a very interesting concept because you look at most um, marketplaces where you can buy things using crypto and it's priced in US dollars. But I, I'm yet to see something since the Silk Road where things are actually measured or, or priced in Bitcoin, right. uh, where it's like, you know, SATs instead of like a conversion, which, uh, yeah, I still think is unique to Silk Road. I'm, I'm sure there are other, you know, maybe darknet marketplaces that do the same thing. Uh, but I don't really haven't seen anything like that in mainstream. Yeah, that is interesting. I mean, we, we might never see that again, right? With the bit maturation of Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah. And the emergence of things like stable coins. And yeah. 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 Uh, I mean, it's it's an obvious use case, though, right? And like, um, I guess, regardless of how you feel about Ross, right? Like, he's still in prison. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, me, I, I, it does feel a little bit like he was made an example of. Um, and yeah. You know, it is, you know, like the guy who, um, the academic publisher who, you know, got in trouble for publishing like academic research. Yeah. You know, it, it feels like the, the U.S. government does not take kindly to that. Yeah, so, I agree. And, and they decided, I mean, it's a, it's a fascinating story, the like how the FBI agents caught up with yeah. Tread Pirate Roberts. And uh, so I, I recommend, you know, as an entertainment, um, I would recommend people uh, dig into it. But so I was in Canada at the time and... Uh, Things like marijuana is legal now in Canada. Yeah, yeah. Uh, at the time, it wasn't. And so, you know, I also had people that were using Silk Road basically just to just to buy weed. And, yeah, and they were like, yeah, yeah. and the the Bitcoin was like, a, the crypto was a secondary part of it. Yeah. But the bit that the marketplace solved was that it was like a little bit safer because you just sent Bitcoin online and then you received 
whatever you were buying in the post. Yeah. And you yeah. didn't have to like go find someone, go meet them. You know, you didn't have to leave your house. Uh, and so, you know, it's kind of like uh, capitalizing on that Amazon type of efficiency. Yeah, I had a very similar experience. It kind of blew my mind how simple it was, how safe it was. Um, yeah, that the fact that a transaction like that could happen and, you know, yeah, you avoided having to go into some, you know, dodgy person's car and drive around <laughs> the block if you wanted to. Yeah. What um what type of economics did you study or what did you um you know major in or what was the what was the focus of your graduate studies? Yeah, so my so you know at a master's level you don't really dig too deep into specific elements of economics. It's still kind of broadly like macro one, macro two, macro three, macro okay. four. Um but my uh, thesis speciality was applied economics. So that involves taking an everyday problem and applying like an econometric or like an economic model to it. Um, so my thesis was on how efficient high performance sports funding in New Zealand is. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I developed a model for that, um, you know, tried to figure out uh, variables that affected the, you know, outcomes, which for me was, you know, meadows. And I had like a side model about whether like, okay you know, sports funding should be directed towards high performance or whether it should be more generalist. So should things like road running be funded more prevalently than, you know, I see. Um, right. yeah, so, meadow sports, which don't have high participation rates, like, I don't know, gymnastics or... Um, well, especially here in New Zealand, right? If you don't yeah. have a large culture, if you don't have a large baseline in terms of like the kids participating in programs, then we probably at the top, top and don't have the same outcomes. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it all kind of changed with uh, the USSR, China, and then the, the UK, Great Britain, having very successful, like, you know, high performance, like funding campaigns, and, you know, getting lots of medals at the Olympic Games, yep. which led to this outcome, uh, which was, you know, national pride, or, you know, uh, happier to be British, happier to be Chinese, you know, something to uh, shine on the global stage. Yep. Um, and New Zealand has you know, taken its high performance sports funding funding model from the UK, it seems like, and a similar sort of hoped outcome, which is, yeah, you know, national pride and lots of medals and, <laughs> you know, aspirational type of, yeah, outcomes. All right. I mean, that that seems, yeah, that's that seems nice and relevant. You haven't looked back on that since though. You're now, let's say, full time in crypto or in, uh, in the finance side. Yeah, I'm deep in the rabbit hole. Yeah. For sure. I still do some some modeling every so often, but it's more like financial modeling these days. Okay. Um, so one of the hottest topics lately is the Bitcoin ETF. Yeah. Um, very broad question. You can you can answer this however you like. Uh, how is the ETF going and uh, how do you see it, uh, you know, affecting markets, either crypto specific or otherwise? Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, good, bad and ugly. I would say it's going that way. Um, so, you know, 2023, uh, I think a lot of Bitcoin bulls and Bitcoin holders were very thankful for the ETF because it created a lot of like speculative price momentum. Um, you know, people saw names like BlackRock, the biggest asset fund manager in the world, Fidelity, the biggest 401k provider in the world, like uh, applying for Bitcoin ETFs. And it was this real sort of validation moment. It was, you know, these big mainstream players um, exploring the idea of Bitcoin, um, and yeah, people got very excited, uh, you know, fast forward to the ETFs actually being launched and what we have observed in, you know, the, the, the weeks since it's been launched is heavy selling pressure, mainly yeah. because of one particular ETF, the Grayscale, um, trust ETF. And, uh, yeah, I, I actually, I wouldn't say this too much. I guess I combined the bad and the ugly there. But, um, and yeah, even then, I don't think that there's more to that story than just like selling pressure because people are bearish. Um, but yeah, I think, and taking a step back and looking at the bigger picture, I think the ETF is a very positive um, step forward for Bitcoin. Um, you know, infrastructure and systems and, you know, uh, expanded markets are always a good thing for an asset class. And yeah, the ETF lets more people, you know, gain exposure to Bitcoin. Um, the spot ETF, which is different from this futures ETF, which was released a couple of years ago, yeah. involves actual physical Bitcoin, not a derivatives contract. 
So again, the ETF providers that are selling, you know, shares of a fund of like paper Bitcoin to the general public actually have to buy physical Bitcoin.